Hello everyone, welcome on the Enlightened uh, Leadership Show. Today we have a great guest, Will Linson. He's a top coach, number one coach, leadership coach from Global Gurus 2022 and founder of the Global Coach Group, a group which helps coaches to be good coaches, to train coaches, and also to coach uh, leaders, leaders worldwide. It's a worldwide online organization uh, with a platform, and in their platform they have a very good 360 assessment. What is a 360 assessment? Soon Will will tell it in a much better way than I can, but in fact it's it's looking from all sides to you. No, uh, the one who's leading you is, is saying something about you. The, the ones with who you are cooperating, your, your line managers on the same level, they're saying something about you. And, and the people uh, whom you are leading, are managing, they're saying something about you. Mm -hmm. And you hear something which can help you in your life. Um, yes. Okay, it's uh, great to have you here, Will. Uh, please tell us uh, everything about your Global Coach Group and also specifically about the 360. How can it trigger um, and help people to find growth areas for mm -hmm. their leadership? Yes, well, thank you for inviting me and it's great to be on your, uh, on your uh, was it webcast today. Uh, so, yeah, my name is Will Linse. I'm the CEO of Global Coach Group. And uh, what we do is basically train coaches to be better in coaching their clients around leadership. And also we coach leaders to be better with their teams. And for that, we have a number of tools and some uh, coaching technology to do that whole process more effectively so that you can create more impact and save time and spend more time on coaching your clients rather than on doing all the administration around that. Um, and of course, then with great results, then you get also more clients. So, um, yeah, why don't you shoot with the first question around 360, uh, Franciscus? Um, what is the most common outcome of uh, growth areas for leaders when mm -hmm. 360 is done. Um, leaders have many areas uh, for growth, but what is commonly coming out? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a fantastic question. And interestingly, um, some of the most commonly selected leadership growth areas that leaders end up with based on their 360 is um, empowering their teams because people are hungry to be empowered. Yeah? Um, listening to people, so not interrupting them and deeply deep listening to them. Um, helping people to speak up. Yeah? And these are kind of sometimes connected, the listening piece and the speak up piece. Um, and then developing their teams so that people are growing up faster so that they are succession ready. So developing their teams, listening, speaking up, and empowering people in their teams. Okay, okay. I uh, indeed have heard that uh, listening skills are of, on, the, on, on the top list of uh, leadership development. Um, I have another question. Uh, we live in highly changing times and mm -hmm. gener Generation Z is uh, strongly coming up in our times. Um, is the 360 assessment adapted uh, to to the needs of um, of the Z generation? Uh, they talk about empathy, about more more mm -hmm. soft skills development, and so forth. And mm -hmm. What do you think? Yeah, so we update our 360 uh, every two years or so to make sure that it's still in line with what uh, what our audience, right, what our clients and their respondents are uh, are asking. And and yes, I think uh, when you look at the the younger people in in organizations, uh, that's more than uh, fifty percent of leaders and more than sixty percent of their respondents. So it's a huge uh, group in organizations already. And I'm talking multinationals here. Mm -hmm. And 
um, yeah, so appreciating diversity, developing people. So these are some of the most important aspects that that these uh, groups are looking for. And yes, the the assessments are continuously adapted so that these are part of of uh, the questions we're asking and being measured properly as well. Mm -hmm. Then I have a question. Mm -hmm. Is it useful and why is it useful that people from, for instance, your management, for your own management team and mm -hmm. your boss and the people whom you are leading, why is it useful to, ha to have them uh, in this process or in this mm -hmm. coaching process? Yeah. So, that's a question we get so often, right? You know, why as a leader do I need to involve my colleagues in leadership? Development? <laughs> and yeah, I, I could talk an hour about that. But if we look at, I'll mention some of the essentials, right? So so part of it is that it, it's, it's like buying a product, right? If, if, I, if I'm providing a service or making a product, then who decides whether that product is a good product, yes or no, right? It's not me who is making it and giving it to people. It's the people who are receiving it, right? They are consumers, right? So they, they decide, hey, that's a good product, that's a good service. And, and they decide with their feet, right? If they like the product they're getting, mm -hmm. they come back and buy more. And if they don't like the product, they go to somebody else, preferably your competitor, right? Um, and with leadership, it's not different, right? The people who decide whether a leader is effective uh, or not effective is the people who work with and for the leader, their team members, right? And if they like the leadership that they're getting from their manager, then they come back for another paycheck next month, right? And if they don't like it, they go over time, sooner mm -hmm. rather than later, and, this, and the smartest people leave first. Yeah? So they also decide with their feet. So one of the big things in leadership that leaders are working on that they say, you know, I need to engage my people better because people are not sticking around, right? And that um, moving of people throughout organizations has actually increased dramatically over the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. Switching hurdles have dramatically lowered. So as a, as a manager, you have to be more effective in engaging your people. Yeah? Um, and therefore, yeah, the coworkers' opinion about your leadership effectiveness, they do really matter, and that's why you need to involve them. Yeah? So that's one reason. You know, their opinions it's, matter. It's your reality as a leader that you are that you are couched in, so you need to involve them. Mm -hmm. uh, now, involving these coworkers is not always an easy thing to do, right? It's relatively simple, but it's not always easy. It's like asking your family members what do you think of me as your, as your uh, parent or, or spouse or, uh, or brother or sister, right? Uh, so it's not always easy, but it is something that is uh, helpful and makes it relevant. Yeah? So then the other piece is that if you as a leader get better, let's, call, uh, let's talk about empowerment or speaking up or listening, there are two ends of that stick. So you can actually can get better much easier, faster in collaboration with your coworkers. So mm -hmm. leadership is a lot about changing as a leader in collaboration with your coworkers. And if you can establish that using uh, our coaching philosophy with Feed Forward, then you actually accelerate that change very quickly. So these are just two of the various reasons why coworker involvement is super important. Their opinion matters, and you can get better faster. Mm -hmm. And what is your experience um, hearing back, if people hear back um, these comments or these remarks from their co-workers, or mm -hmm. from, uh, from their... Um, are they courageous enough to... to to act upon it, or, or are they just uh, saying, ah, they are just my workers, I, I'm going my own way anyway? Mm -hmm. So that's a good point, right? So in the initial 360, then we kind of look back and, and look at feedback. That's what 360 is all about. It's a feedback yes. collection mechanism in a very structured and relatively objective sense. Yeah? Then 
and we can talk about a little later um, in coaching and changing moving forwards involving coworkers. We actually focus on feed forward, so it's easier to talk about suggestions rather than about feedback. But mm-hmm. let's focus on feedback, right? So the the 360 provides a lot of feedback, and sometimes that's kind of hard to look at all those data. And one of the ways which I think is 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 key in, in using the 360 as we are doing it is also how you debrief that feedback. And part of it is what we tell leaders is like, you know, let's go through these data. It's like looking in the mirror. You might or might not like all the stuff you see, but it's the reality that you're looking at. And, you know, it's only you looking in the mirror. Nobody else look, uh, knows all these data. Only you mm-hmm. know these data. Mm-hmm. And the only thing that you need to uh, kind of step up to is pick one or two things from the 360 feedback that you think that's important to you for you to change, and that's also important for your coworkers to see that change. Mm-hmm. And all the other things, it it ain't really matter. It doesn't matter, right? Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter now. Okay. So pick one or two things. That's really the objective of our 360 exercise and debrief. Mm-hmm. And now the problem becomes a lot easier for people, right? That means, you know, I don't need to change everything. I don't need to accept everything. I only need to embrace one or two things that I really want to get better at. That's important to me and the people around me. Hmm. Hmm. If I hear you, then it's something like uh, Steve Jobs said. Um, Steve Jobs um, in Apple, he often said, you know, uh, we got to listen to the customers what they want mm-hmm. and we adapt our product on that mm-hmm. uh, this is a product this is apple now the apple evolved in a, in a in a very useful computer which is liked by most people who mm-hmm. want really to use well a computer if it works on a leader like that yes that would be very good mm-hmm. uh, mm, if i look to myself will if my wife says, you should change that, then I have a certain kind, is she objective? Why should I do that? Which, which remarks of your mm, co-workers are the best? Uh, if she says, you know, I really don't like that, you should do it different. I, I I tend to neglect it. Uh, you know, sure. it, it shows a little bit of my own stubborn nature, of course. <laughs> but if I imagine if you're a boss and, you know, some people say, you know, he, he's just not a nice guy. Uh, I, I'm, you know, I don't want to listen to him. How do you handle such things? Mm-hmm. Well, so most leaders have enough information in their feedback to choose one or two things from they get better at, right? So mm. uh, it is not that people say, you know, uh, of the, uh, in the, in our case, 15 competencies and 72 items, you know, from the 72 things, I couldn't find anything, right? Most of the time people uh. have like 20, 30 things they can get better at. Oh. The point is, yeah, you don't need to get better at 20, 30 things, just pick one thing. And if you don't uh. like uh, listening to your wife to use your metaphor, then pick something else. I'm sure there is something. Right? Sure, and, sure. That you can sure, agree. Yes, yes. So it, it's that. Yeah. So part of it is uh, look at your your uh, functional responsibility as a manager, right? So if I'm mm. head of operations, right? Then and if it comes out of there, we need to be more kind of effective in our execution. Mm-hmm. Then I might not like that so much that people told this to me, but at the same time, it's like, yeah, you know, I'm head of operations, and if everybody thinks effective execution is something we need to get better at, then, you know, I just need to embrace that. Mm. And at the same time, as a leader, I realize, yeah, you know, that's not just about me. That's about us, right? Mm -hmm. Me and my team. So Mm -hmm. I'm I'm responsible for it because I'm the captain on the ship. But at the end of the day, it's it's as much as about them as it is about me. Mm. So people then embrace that. And that's the role of the coach to help the leader to be at peace with some of that information. Yes, yes, yes. This this is quietening me down. You know, I know for myself that I have good things and I have bad things. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. <laughs> and I have quite a lot of bad things. And the, the idea of getting better at many bad things at once is really problematic. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
Ja. Especially when, when your wife enumerates, this is no good, and this is no good, and this is no good. But I understand. I understand that it can be better um, mm -hmm. when it is when you're given the choice for one or two items. Yeah, exactly. Right. So now the power is back to you, right? And uh, so the people have then a number of things to choose from. And now, so you're an executive, you're a leader, you're in decision making mode anyway. So now it's time to decide, right? And uh, same as in a family, maybe there are five or six, six things you could do better. The point is, yeah, pick something from that list. Mm. That's what other people said that will help you to be better. And it's important to them too. And of mm -hmm. course, same as in a family, as a, as a parent, you know, you want to pick something that's important to the people in the family, not just important to you. Yeah? Mm. So it's that logic. So people mm -hmm. embrace that. People Good. embrace it very quickly. Um, I mean, I have been debriefing thousands and thousands of leaders over the many years. Yes. And, uh, some people are, let's call them very difficult people to deal with mm -hmm. and very difficult to debrief. Uh, however, I have never had uh, any occasion where people did not come out with, you know, I think I should pick this. Yeah. And people embrace that. So part of it is also how you tell the story of the, of the, uh, mm. of the 360, right? Mm. Uh, kind of stepping back shortly here, you know, a 360 assessment by definition should be a, an assessment that has a, a that gives you structured feedback, right? So it's, it's structured and kind of somewhat uh, objective because it is based on a certain model. In our case, it's the global leadership assessment. There are many other assessments as well. So there's a certain uh, structured competencies and you mm -hmm. get measured feedback, uh, preferably uh, based on a norm group, like in our case. And it's a little bit like stepping on a weighing scale, right? So mm -hmm. the number is one thing, right? And then you need to use that number and compare that with with uh, other people who are like you, right? So if you are uh, a six foot male, then, and you weigh uh, 83 kilo, like in my case, then that's all right. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you are, if you are a five foot uh, and you weigh 83 kilo, that might not be all right. Yeah? And that is then for you as an individual to say, you know, is that a number I want to be bothered with? Yes or no. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So that, there's a lot of information, you know, 360 gives you a kind of an objective view to look at many different things. And then from there, pick something you get excited about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, could you say, uh, could you compare, for instance, the, um, the 360 analysis with uh, financial balance? You have credits, you have debits, uh, you have sites of possession, you have sites mm -hmm. of debts. Um, and all the time in business, you're trying to improve your mm -hmm. your balance. Yes, this is more or less what you're trying to do in balance yeah. uh, in, in business. Uh, if you think of a balance, maybe it's not so bad because everybody has a balance of, you know, some good and bad qualities, some mm -hmm. credits mm -hmm. and debits. And uh, mm, I had a. There came a question in my mind, for instance, um, does the 360 assessment also embrace um, condition and health issues of the leader? N uh, no, not. Uh, so th that depends on what, what 360 uh, people use. Uh, so in our case, it doesn't really uh, measure things around kind of mental health or stress, because mm -hmm. these are kind of outcomes mm -hmm. as a result of behavior. So mm -hmm. we focus on a competencies that multinational organizations have determined as being important competencies for their leaders. Mm -hmm. So this was, uh, this is an assessment made by multinationals for multinationals mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and people who work in an internationalizing environment, which is pretty much anybody else, anybody nowadays, right? Even the baker on the, around the corner, is um, dealing with competitive issues from uh, was it online stores and what they sell. Yeah? Mm. So, and the baker probably sells a lot of stuff, buys a lot of stuff himself online, yeah? whether mm. it's uh, exactly. parts for the machinery or flour for their uh, production. So, 
Um, so the outcomes of that, right? The outcomes of, of behavior being job satisfaction or stress levels or um, uh, yeah, mental health or biophysical issues are not measured by most 360 assessments. Okay, okay. Um, then I have a similar question. Um, we live in very challenging times. It means times of great change. Sometimes uh, you could say these changes are like um, going from water to steam or from water to ice. Mm -hmm. um, there's a great change in our functioning of society, in the generations mm -hmm. and so forth. Um, I have a friend who who's teaching uh, visionary abilities um, to look ahead. Uh, he says that most of the leaders are firefighters today. Uh, mm -hmm. They only have time to uh, grasp the issues which are not going well, and they have no time to look ahead. Um, that naturally comes to my mind. Um, is this also visible in your um, 360 assessments? Can, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so, so the short answer is yes. And, you know, a, a part of what we live in in our world, in our world of work, mm -hmm. yes. is that, um, I mean, you have seen this in your corporate career too, is that mm -hmm. you go to work and 90% of the time you're working on solving problems, mm -hmm. right? Short-term mm -hmm. problems, long-term mm -hmm. problems. Mm -hmm. uh, and you're all in meetings with people to talk about problems and decide how to resolve problems, et cetera, et cetera, right? That, that's mm -hmm. the nature of work, right? Basically, if there are no problems, there is no work and no job, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like one of my earlier bosses says, big problems, big jobs, and small problems, small jobs, right? I think mm -hmm. everybody understands that piece. Yeah. Now, the challenge in our world of work is that uh, in the past, when we were when we were faxing things in the 70s, right, mm -hmm. then the, the cycle of our problems were basically uh, cycles that happened in, in days, right? And then mm -hmm. an email came about, and now the ping pong around problems becomes much faster, right, in, in maybe hours, right, or one or two days cycles. But now with messaging platforms being part of our world of work as well, mm -hmm. uh, people are just shooting things back and forth on a minute by minute basis. So, to mm -hmm. say. so that mm -hmm. basically means our problems are coming in faster and are being treated with more, more messaging, right? And, and they need to be resolved faster. And at mm -hmm. the same time, I got the feeling that people read less stuff, right? People don't necessarily read all the messages and emails that you sent them. Mm -hmm. and consequently, there's a lot of miscommunication happening. Mm -hmm. So consequently, yeah, it's a lot of short-term uh yeah, short-term problems that we're dealing with because a lot of problems just come faster and need to be resolved faster before mm. things spin out of control. So I think that's a very fair understanding that that's happening. It's not a new thing, right? This already happens over the last 50 years mm. that the cycle of things getting faster has increased. This is just another version of it because um, our, our messaging systems are becoming part of our workplace over the last five, six years. Hmm, that's right. That's right. Okay, maybe, Will, what would you think? We open the floor for some questions. I see Sounds some like people. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, please uh, feel welcome to ask questions. I see uh, Dr. Wasit from Thailand, uh, Katrin Hall, and Yasser Wahid. Please feel free to uh, just type some questions in your platform so we can read them here. So since we have a, a lot of people from very different uh, uh, geographical areas and cultures right there already anyway, I feel also free to come up with some questions that particularly uh, are related to your culture or your work environment, ladies and gentlemen. Don't hesitate around that. Okay. So as we're waiting for a question, can I surely say something around different cultures and coaching and co-workers yes please yes please i believe you are very experienced because you've been coaching in east and west in the whole world yeah and the middle east <laughs> <laughs> yeah i've been coaching in, in asia europe north america and, and south america mainly brazil 
Mm-hmm. So yeah, uh, so the, the beautiful thing of involving coworkers in the coaching process is you get an, an autocorrect for culture and an autocorrect for diversity. Because mm. if you're asking people, uh, if, I, if I say, hey, I want to get better at, uh, uh, at listening up, right? And I would ask people for suggestions in Europe around this or, or in, in uh, Netherlands, Belgium or, or Germany, then people would come up with suggestions like, okay, just uh, don't talk and give space, space for other people to talk. That would be their suggestion, right? Which is like, yeah, fine, I can do that. Now, if you would ask the, the same question for and suggestions for people in, um, in many parts of Asia, mm-hmm. and their suggestion actually would be, say, uh, please specifically ask people and invite them into the conversation. As in, hey, Franciscus, uh, since we're talking about this particular issue, what do you think about that? Yeah. So you invite them in the conversation. So these are actually opposite suggestions that the leader not necessarily would come up with on their own. However, coworkers come up with these suggestions from their side because it makes sense to them and makes value to them. Mm-hmm. And you wouldn't necessarily expect these differentiation from different stakeholders or, or coworkers. And the beautiful part of it is that uh, it helps uh, people in different cultures to come up with things that really pertain to their p- specific environment. Mm. And you can only do that if you ask the coworkers for suggestions. So that whole coworker involvement um, works in all the different cultures and autocorrects for culture and diversity at the same time. Mm. Perfect. Works perfect. Yes, that sounds very good. Um I was shortly in China and remember indeed that people are, have to be motivated to talk, have to be opened up and uh, they're kind of much shyer to talk, I would say. Um, yeah. I don't know what is your experience. And in the West, we like to over talk to, to, you know. To yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, it, it's... Uh, it's part of people's culture and part of people's personality. So it's a kind of a culture and diversity thing. Mm-hmm. And it's not that they don't want that, that people don't want to talk, but people feel like, you know, it's not appropriate for me to just start start talking about things and venting my opinion. Whereas mm-hmm. in some mm-hmm. countries, it's okay to say, hey, you know, this is my opinion and I have a right to say my opinion. Mm-hmm. But in many other countries, people are not... Um, not not trained or educated or born in a way that that's mm-hmm. plausible, right? So so they don't, um, and that's that's therefore as a leader you need to yeah be be sensitive to that, and you know if you want people's input, then if they don't say it, then ask for it. Mm-hmm. Yes. Okay. Okay, that's uh, good knowledge. All it means. If I think well, you have a fantastic experience of communication independent of culture. Um, this Including brings me culture, right. It, it includes the culture at the same time. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Because if I see, I just wanted to ask you a question. It's a uh, it's maybe not a question for your area, but since you are such an experienced man in many cultures, I have a tendency to ask you this question. Mm-hmm. Mm, if we see mm, the present problems, for instance, uh, we have this war in the Ukraine, it's it's a few hundred kilometers from my house. Um, it, it made me awake with something which I never thought so much about. Um, if education in in all the countries would be on higher levels there wouldn't be any war because people would know that there also live people and we can't destroy them and there's no need to destroy them because i'm not educated with hate I'm not educated to hate the West. I'm not educated to hate to hate the East. Uh, this is. I'm not sure I'm bringing you on a slippery level because you have been coaching in corporations and worldwide business organizations. And if we come to politics, I sometimes think, oh my God, 
if leadership on that level would be higher, if people would educate their people better with universal knowledge, if then we would have lots less problems and much more work in our world. We wouldn't mm -hmm. have to to gain money by making weapons in war, but we would be gaining money by making some nice things. Mm -hmm. uh, please tell you, me your thoughts. Uh, I'm sorry if I'm taking yeah, so, too far away. No, I'll, I'll bring us back to the, the point of leadership right here. Okay. So, um, one of the things that we that we don't have enough in this world is people who have been uh, in each other's environment enough. I mean, I've been working and living in yeah in the Middle East, in uh, in India, in China, in Japan, Korea, Indonesia, Singapore. I mean, many other countries in Asia, uh, obviously in Europe, in many countries uh, in uh, in the U.S. Uh, as well as been visiting Brazil many times, and you really understand uh, other cultures much better if you if you live together, work together, do things together, right? Have meals together, talk about things together. Mm -hmm. And yeah, of course, there are always things you still like, disagree uh, or agree with, and that's all fine. Uh, but you will see that there that that there is so much more that we have in common as human beings than our passports or whatever things divide us. And that is very, very great. So if if more people would just work more with other people from different environments, actually our world would much more come together. And then you, we also re realize that the diversity that we think that exists actually doesn't even exist that much because it is really, we're all so much more same than we are think that we are different, but on, on the surface, it's different. Mm -hmm. Right, because we we see the different behavior, but you know behind the surface it's the same. And um, I was working with uh, a high level executive in, in one of the very large companies who deals with a lot of different people from different ways. And he says, you know, for me diversity is very simple. People are being uh, assessed and rewarded based on their behaviors and how they live the values in our organization, and everything else doesn't matter. I don't look at anything else. I don't look at passport or gender or uh, ethnicity or what country they're from. He says, it really doesn't matter to me. It's, it's mm -hmm. all about the quality of their behavior and how they live their values. That's the only thing. And I thought, wow, yeah, that's just so cool and so true because then all the other colors of the rainbow that we start to label people on don't matter anymore. Right? Mm. Because it's really about if we both have good quality behavior in how we work together, then everything melts away. And that's fantastic. And that's what we need more in this world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But, you know, yeah, it doesn't always happen like that. Mm -hmm. Also, there's a general feeling that um, it's very difficult to, to change kind of cultural thinking or behaviors uh, if it is difficult to change it in a corporation, <laughs> it's yeah. more difficult to change it in the counties yeah. and so forth. Uh, I, my, mm, I was for two weeks on, on on a New Year's trip to China. I was just flabbergasted by the openness of the people, mm -hmm. the friendliness of the people. I, I was told so many things which didn't correlate with my experience there. Mm -hmm. And I can agree on your experience. It means... But now, Will, we can travel the whole world even like we do now on, on the internet. Yeah. Yeah, and talk with people everywhere, yes. Yes. And that's exactly how, how understanding of different people from different environments easily uh, comes together and becomes much more working together, right? Because the, you see that uh, so many leaders have members in their teams from many different places. And many times they never really uh, saw these people in the same room together, right? They're always in e-meetings together, uh, mm -hmm. preferably with a camera like we are doing. Mm -hmm. um, and that's how, let's say 90 plus percent of people's interaction goes because uh, they, might not, they might not really see people in a, in a co-location sense throughout mm -hmm. their career because people move around or people are in temporary in temporary roles and projects or this or that. So we need to learn to work together in 
and work effectively to work together in these environments. And then, you know, behavior matters because at the end of the day, results matter, right? In results in terms of how people um, engage their team, deliver their performance, and how we do this in a collaborative manner. Mm -hmm. so. No, thank you very much, Will. Meanwhile, we have a question here. Um, I'll show it on the screen. Uh, hello, gentlemen. Uh, it's Dr. Silpi Gupta. Uh, I'm from India. Thank you, Dr. Gupta, for this question. I'm from India. Role of assessment center or development center in identifying potential leaders of future. What type of activity to be used? What is the role of psychometric evaluation in this process? Yes, that's a very big uh, question, uh, Dr. Shilpi Gupta. So, uh, an assessment center is very useful for that process of uh, assessing the quality of potential leaders for the future. Um, now, assessment center is basically a group of trained professionals who have a number of conversations and basically then ascertain people's capabilities with a number of case studies and other group sessions where they observe or let people do cases, uh, where then people demonstrate their competencies and capabilities, and then they can then label that. So that is a, a little bit of an artificial environment in a way, right? Because it is... Uh, people from a company coming together in smaller groups, doing things and then observed and assessed by others. So that is generally being seen as a uh, effective way to do that. Now, what we talk about today, uh, 360 leadership assessments uh, is for the purpose of people's development and not for the purpose of um, assessment center and identifying uh, potential leaders for the for the future. So that that's has a is a very different use case. Yeah? Um, and psychometric assessments and evaluation in this process are useful uh, useful in in terms of the assessment center that Dr. Gupta is talking about mm -hmm. uh, because it it helps you to identify people's uh, personal preferences and behavioral preferences and see how that helps in certain type of roles that people are uh, are fit for, right? For instance, if somebody is very introverted, then to, to move them into uh, roles of uh, communication and uh, sales might not be uh, a wise move, right? It doesn't necessarily qualify or disqualify, but it's more like, you know, that might not be a wise move, so you want to make that a separate conversation. I don't want to necessarily re recommend any particular tools um, in our conversation today because that really depends on what type of assessment center you're running. Uh, Dr. Gupta, feel free to send me a, a message through LinkedIn and then I can maybe refer you to some people who are expert in this area. Okay, I still had a question coming to my mind before we get another question from the public. So, sh shall I uh, make a short kind of statement around uh, another thing that is useful in coaching as it relates to assessments uh, as, as we're talking today? And yes, maybe, sure. Maybe your question comes back to mind? Yes, yes, yes. So, earlier we talked about, you know, how do you select the best area to develop. And I said, you know, just pick one or two uh, and then embrace those and make sure that these one or two are important to you and to people around you. Then the next conversation you as a coach can have with that leader is helping them understand that if you change one thing, then many other things also change uh, as a leader and become more effective. And then you see, see that, ah, you know, if I change this one thing, many other things that I'm actually not focusing on to really change, they kind of change as a result of that. Um, and let me give you a, an example that we know from our, uh, from our health management as a person, right? So if I say, you know, I'm going to uh, 
be on a diet and eat more consciously. So I, let's say I eat, I eat less and I eat more vegetables, two very simple things, right? Then if I do that, then many other of my health parameters also change, right? I probably lose weight. Um, I, uh, my, my, a lot of my blood, uh, uh, was a blood quality aspects improve. Mm -hmm. uh, I probably sleep better. Um, I, uh, probably choose to exercise more because it helps with my metabolism. Mm -hmm. My, uh, my skin quality gets better. I heal faster, right? Um, relational aspects improve my, uh, my spouse might say, Hey, you, you look better or, you know, Hey, uh, this, this shirt that I like now fits you better, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Right. So there's a lot of other aspects also mm -hmm. change. So that splash benefit system, you can also apply in coaching at that point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and then for, for a leader, it's important to realize, ah, you know, I don't need to change everything. I just need to change one thing that I really embrace. Yeah. And by understanding that I have this business case that I can build around that, I realize, mm -hmm. oh, you know, if I just really focus on that one thing, then many other things also going to start getting better. Mm -hmm. And then life gets better across for me and the people who work for me. Right? So oh. Again, that's another reason why that co-worker involvement is so important because it helps mm -hmm. you to get better for you. It helps you to get better uh, for them too. And now everybody wins. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, this this is an interesting question which comes to my mind. Um, if you start a coaching process, and uh, this remark of you, you know, you pull one leg of the table mm -hmm. and the other legs come uh, come along, yes? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yeah. But, but this might also apply, uh, for instance, in, in the family. Um, it, yeah. it means, you know, you're becoming a better leader but you might be better liked at home. Yeah. Yeah, I should have done this coaching much earlier, Will. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Of course, as a leader, you don't improve in isolation, right? If you uh, start listening better or empower people even, then if you do that at work, you also will start doing this at home, right? By... Uh, empowering your kids, right? Mm. Or listening better to your spouse or other people in the family. Mm. Yeah, mm. exactly. Fantastic. <laughs> That's the beauty of it, right? That's the beauty of it. Focus on one thing, really embrace that, uh, mobilize the people around you because that help structure helps you to get better. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the, the three the three magic, magic aspects of becoming better as a human being and as a leader is mm -hmm. focus, structure, and help. Mm -hmm. right? So focus on one or two things that you really want to do, then have a structure that you can rely on because you know that that structure works because you're getting out of your comfort zone into uh, the not so comfort zone. And if you mm -hmm. can rely on the structure, now you feel comfortable again, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and then the help from the people around you, if you can mobilize that, then they help you to get better. And as a result, they feel that you being better helps them too, which encourages them to help you even further to get better. So that help structure really incentivizes everybody to create things to the next level. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I understand. That, that sounds uh, great, Will. Uh, it means the leader takes an initiative with, uh, with simply starting with one or two of his um, things to improve, for instance, uh, better listening or, or whatever. And then later, this if he succeeds in improving himself, he might be an inspiration for others to yeah. do the same. So it's more or less a ripple wave, a ripple yeah. wave of... Uh, yeah. And what is the function of the coach? In, in this all, because yeah. more or less it's a do-it-yourself shop, the 360 assessment. So the 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 function of the coach is really to to facilitate the process, right? So part of the facilitation is to help the leader from the 360 to pick the right things to work at. Mm -hmm. 
and so that's huge value, right? So if you go to the doctor and you get your medical report, the doctor can say, here's the report, you pick something, right? Mm -hmm. But you feel like, yeah, you know, it would be nice to listen to the doctor and let, uh, hear that person's advice or guidance mm -hmm. in that process. So the facilitation of the improvement process is the main role of the coach. Yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Secondly, the main role of the coach is to be the ambassador of the coworkers in the process, right? Because many times leaders, they want a lot of stuff. And if you mm -hmm. as a coach tell the leader, you know, that might be great from your perspective. But, mm -hmm. you know, if I'm working for you as a coworker, I'm not sure I'm feeling that that's going to help me or mm -hmm. us. So how can you do it in a way that's good for you and good for them at the same time? Right. So that coworker ambassador role is super important. And then the third one is to facilitate the process to help the leader to be on a forward moving. Uh, yeah, in a forward moving mode all the time so you're more or less an advocate of of the co-workers yeah. Be because yeah. a soundboard uh an, an uh, amplifier yeah yeah of their feelings and thoughts yeah yeah exactly so that's why i'm saying you're the ambassador right you're mm -hmm. you're you're their vote in the room at the table with the co-workers mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay Okay, mm, I'm just looking. I think there's another question coming up. Ah, Dr. Gupta says thank you. You're and welcome. I see no questions. If there's any more questions, please ask them because we're in the last part of our conversations. Uh, I think we could talk for hours because. <laughs> Uh, it, it's it's a very beautiful process, this self-improvement process. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you can apply that with with anything. So we focus on leadership development and helping leaders to get better with their teams. Mm -hmm. But you can imp use this uh, this methodology and these principles in any area of your life. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, yes. That sounds uh, fantastic. Um, it's some kind of help for self-development with the help of a coach and co-workers. And yeah. the 360 is a, is a good beginning. It's a beginning, yeah. uh, as you say, I like that uh, what you said, it looks like a slip from the doctor, but we can't even read it, the slip from the doctor, because it has all kinds of technical terms. And what do I care if if my microglobin something like that is a little bit higher or lower? I can I don't know even what it means. Yeah. Yes. So, could you say um, that this kind of coaching, behavioral coaching, is a, is a coaching doctor? It's a, it's a behavioral doctor, a doctor for behavior. <laughs> well, it, it, so. The, uh, Kind of yes and no. And in the end of the day, people heal themselves in terms of leadership behavior and change, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that that's most important. Yeah, so you don't want to create a dependency on a coach who mm -hmm. who is a know-it-all. That's not the function of the coach. Uh, mm -hmm. The coach is, is not a consultant. The coach is a facilitator. Um, and uh, I always compare it with the uh, a symphony orchestra director, right? That's the coach. Mm -hmm. And so the, the coach is directing all uh, the people in the orchestra to make music together in a symphonic way. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, the orchestra director is the only one not making any music, not making any noise, right? And I think that's exactly, exactly. Coach, what you need to do, right? The more you can kind of orchestrate, right, and facilitate the leader and the coworkers to do, to engage together and to, uh, contribute to the action plan and the action plan being implemented, the more you're the orchestrator of all that, mm -hmm. and you make actually the least noise and you get the biggest progress. Mm -hmm. And that's that's exactly uh, what is the success factor. Now, that's not always easy. Um, that's one of the reasons why we're using technology in the coaching process, because that helps to very time efficiently create all that interaction. But that's maybe another discussion for another time. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. It, uh, it's, it's a very good, uh, very nice discussion. I like it very much. I hope um, the attendants enjoyed it. Um, we could go on, I think, for another hour. 
And Will, uh, would you be uh, pleased with another session, maybe in one or two months? Sounds like a fantastic De idea. Yeah, deepening it out and uh, telling more, mm -hmm. maybe, maybe also with some slides, something to show which behavioral aspects uh, you know you can improve, and maybe a, a little taste of of the three hundred and sixty. What do you think? Well, that could be one. Uh, uh, we also can talk about my upcoming book called uh, Triple Win Leadership Coaching. So that could be all, another thing we could uh, talk about. So I'm happy to Hattic. go whatever you're excited about at that point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it sounds good. It sounds fantastic, Will. I'm not sure. I will have a look where there's any more questions. There's some people coming up still here. Givar Singh from Rator, nice to see you. From India. There are no more questions. Maybe um, you would like to finish with something. I, I would like to ask you to stay online with me after the show. Mm -hmm. But maybe you would like to... I can only say thank you very much, Will. For me, it's so inspiring to... Uh, to hear all these things, uh, behavioral improvement is a great skill. Um, somebody said, you know, to develop yourself spiritually and to believe in God, it's all nice. But sometimes you see no behavioral improvement. Behavioral improvement is a very practical thing. Hmm. Yeah. It directly affects others. Um, hmm. may, maybe, maybe you can say still something about the, this a theory, uh, fake it until you make it. What do you think about that? Because that, that, that's also a kind of behavioral uh, snippet, but does that work? Well, so behavior, and this, this comes from when we start growing up as little babies and started walking and talking and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, we fake it until we make it. We kind of try and try and try until it's good enough. That's how we learn how to eat and uh, and how to write and everything else we do. Uh, and uh, one, one very important thing I, I learned over the many years being in coaching and helping leaders with behavioral change, that it is very outcome driven. If the people like the outcome, they will change their behavior very, very quickly, yeah? as quickly as they can. Mm -hmm. If people don't like the outcome or not so committed to the outcome, behavioral change actually takes a lot longer or doesn't happen, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that's why when we were young kids and you needed to learn how to walk in order to get into the next drawer or to get things from the table, is like, you know, I really want that outcome, what's in that drawer or what's on that table. That's how the painful process of learning how to walk actually went very, very quickly, right? So cookies, cookies on the table. Yeah, exactly. It's the incentive of the outcome, right? And if we look at it in our own life as a as an adult, right? Some things we change really very quickly because we like the outcome. Yeah? Uh, the way we drive on the road, right? I mean, I've been driving in many different countries, including on countries where we where they drive on the left and the right side, mm -hmm. and you adapt very quickly to the other side of the road because you need that outcome elsewhere. You either have an accident and, and you are maybe injured or the police pulls you aside and you have other consequences. So mm. you, you adapt very, very quickly because you like that other outcome. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And other things uh, are much more difficult to change because the outcome is not so important to you. The consequences right, of not achieving the outcome are not there. Mm -hmm. right? So it's outcome driven. So the more I embrace and want the outcome that is associated with a new behavior, the easier it comes. It's very pragmatic then. Yeah, I mean, I'll give you one example. And um, many years ago, one of, my, uh, one of my best friends who happens to be Indian, his name is Sanjeev, he said, hey, Will, you're a left-handed. Try to brush your teeth with the, with the other hand, with the right hand. And you, you, you can experience the difficulties around behavioral change, right? So for more than five years, I've been uh, focusing on trying to brush my teeth with the other hand. Yeah? 
and you know, you get up in the morning and you start brushing your teeth and, and then you're done with your brushing your teeth. And many times, even nowadays, I realize, oh my goodness, I don't even know what hand I used, let alone the right hand. Yeah. So because there is no consequence to using one hand or the other, right? My behavioral change has not really made a lot of progress because I don't really mind and there is no consequence to, to wrong behavior. Mm. If, if, however, there was a consequence, I have an electric toothbrush, so if the electric toothbrush would give me an electric shock if I would do it in the, uh, in the left hand versus the right hand, I would have changed that behavior 100% already a long time ago, but it doesn't. Mm -hmm. So it's very outcome-based, which is very pragmatic, which makes it very simple, which makes it very simple. I like it. I like um, when things, when idealism and pragmatism are combined, yeah. uh, inner and outer, some character, character and achievement, character and achievement. Mm -hmm. Well, I... Uh, wish you to stay on for a few minutes we'll mm -hmm. talk in the, our studio and uh, i would like to thank the public mm. and i think next time your book uh, is a great idea so mm -hmm. uh, let's talk about it next time and uh, th thank the public for their attendance and uh, it will be replayed on uh, linkedin automatically so people can follow also when they didn't have time mm -hmm. now Fantastic, yeah. All right, well, Franciscus, thank you very much for inviting me, and it was great to share what we talked about today around the 360 assessments and the coaching related to that with uh, with you and uh, and your audience. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to more questions from you or more questions for them, whatever the case may be. We're both on LinkedIn, and then we'll take it from there. So thank you very much, Franciscus. Okay, great, great time. <laughs>